Hey everyone, Eric here. Very quickly before we get to the show, I want to make sure that you know about the daily email newsletter that Cobus and I put together. What we're doing here with this newsletter is capturing the conversations that are taking place about China-Africa relations. Whether it's the latest reports from think tanks, scholarly research, what activists are saying, and of course all of the discussions that are taking place on social media. And we're featuring a lot of primary source material. So if you're a researcher, an analyst, a journalist covering these issues, this newsletter is perfect for you. To find out more, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Give it a try free for two weeks. See if you like it. And if you use the promo code podcast at checkout, we'll give you a big juicy discount. Also, if you're a student or teacher, it's always half price. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, one of the more durable misperceptions about the Chinese in Africa, and I mean durable, this goes back decades, is that there isn't enough skills transfer or technology transfer going on in the China-Africa relationship. So the idea here is that the Chinese are coming, investing huge amounts of money, loaning huge amounts of money to build massive infrastructure projects, and they work on something called the BOT process, which is the Build, Operate, Transfer So Chinese contractors build a railway or a highway or a toll road. Then they operate it for a period of five to 10 years, whatever the agreement says, and then they transfer it. And it's in that operate mode that there's a concern that not enough local employees are being trained on how to run the railways, run the dams and whatnot. That's actually a misperception. We're going to talk today about railways in particular, because that is the focus in Kenya and Nigeria, where obviously in Kenya, the standard gauge railway is now complete and it's been built for a couple of years and it's up and running. Uh, Local staff are, in fact, uh, now starting to take over some of the key engineering positions. But in Nigeria, they're just starting some of their standard gauge railway production and construction. And at the same time, we're starting to see now more and more Uh, young uh, Nigerian engineers going off to China, and at the same time, they're also building uh, transportation universities and training and vocational programs in Africa. So China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation, which is the big mega state-owned Chinese company that works in Nigeria and many African countries, is building Nigeria's first transportation university in the city of Dara in the northern state of Katsina. In Kenya, the China Road and Bridges Corporation, CRBC, And the China Communications and Construction Company, those are two, again, big, big state-owned enterprises. They invested $10 million to upgrade Kenya's Railway Training Institute and also built engineering an engineering school specializing in standard gauge railway operations. So thousands of young people are actually being trained to to take over some of these roles that are currently being done by Chinese engineers. But it's one of the parts of the story, Kobus, that we keep running into that is very durable in terms of people thinking that this isn't happening. Yes, there's, China is dinged all the time for not providing enough training or not being being kind of fast enough with skills transfer. So, so this is interesting to look at, um, particularly to see how this training works and, and what kind of knowledge is transferred. We also tend to talk a lot about p- political uh, officials being being trained in China and the kind of impl- the ideological implications of that, and we don't focus enough on the actual transfer of, of technical skills. So it's really interesting to discuss it. So let's get a first-hand perspective on some of that training that Kobus talked about, and we are so thrilled to have on the program today a recent brand new minted graduate from uh, Central South University, Zhong Nandashue in Changsha, China, Arulagbe Shakuruddin Olobanji from Nigeria, who is an exchange student from Amadu Bello University in Zaria, Nigeria. And again, he just graduated from Central South University uh, with an engineering degree, and we're just so proud to have you on the show because you are a newly minted graduate. Congratulations, Arulagbe, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Eric. 
Pleasure to be with you today. I have to say to you that I am really excited to have you because, you know, in these days, there's not a lot of good news that we're experiencing in 2020. 2020 is a poop year all around. But when I posted pictures of your graduation on my Twitter feed, uh, it was amazing to see how much love came out for you and, and all of your fellow graduates. And it was retweeted and people just had nothing but positive things to say uh, on your Twitter feed. Uh, you got 2,400, 2,500 likes, uh, hundreds of comments, and it was just really a wonderful kind of respite from all the bad news that we've been getting. And not only were your friends and your classmates proud of what you did, but also just people all over the world were celebrating not you, and but also your classmates' great accomplishments. How did it feel when you saw that kind of reaction from people? Very, very nice to have uh, such um feeling and uh, a moment like that because um it's one of the first kind of a uh, program that was initiated from uh, Nigeria and uh, Amadou Bello as an institution. So it's really, really a very big um um moment for us, an happy moment for us having such uh, a feeling. Well, let's get started before we get into the details of your program. Tell us a little bit about. Uh, what you studied at Central South University, how you came there, and just tell us a little bit about your experience there. The Triple True program uh, is a new program from Nigeria where a student from Amadou Bello have studied from under level to 300 level and me sent here to come and study um, a part, a branch of civil engineering, which is a railway engineering. So the main focus was to come to this place and be trained under railway engineering because the country is developing more on the railway infrastructure. So when we got to um, Central South University, different courses were being introduced in continuation of the the, the three years we spent uh, we spent in the in Amadou Bello University Zaya. So when we got here, most of the courses were kind of related with what we've done from uh, the under level to three under level. So when we got to Central South University, most of the courses that were the emphasis were based on railway engineering, and uh, when we started. Because the railway engineering is a new course, is a new course on its own that, that, that was just introduced to us. Because right from under level from AB Amadou Ben Zaya, nothing like railway was being taught. Why? Because it's not among the curriculum. So when we go to this place, the 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 the, the scheme of work, the curriculum were were a bit strange and uh, new to the my colleagues. So because of the challenge we were up to, we were able to take up the tax from the the two years spent here. And uh, at the end of our um, the program, which is the final year, most of our our topics were based on railway engineering, just to get more knowledge about the the program. So the lecturers, the school were really really happy to have such a uh, intelligent student in their school because we're up to the tax because we're being picked by some of the staffs of the Central South University and the staff of CCECC, the China Civil Engineering Construction Company. So the experience got in here was very, very an exceptional experience because we were really trained in such a way to us to go and um, the, give back the knowledge to our country because the country is developing on the railway infrastructure. Can you unpack a little bit what a railway engineering degree comprises? Um, you know, like in my mind, it, it, it does it mostly focus on on laying the rail itself, or like what are some of the other aspects that you were studying? Yeah, the maintenance aspect, the operating aspect, the transportation under the railway engineering. We have the transportation engineering. So the transportation engineering mainly focus on the the operation and maintenance of it. The, the mechanical engineering as well were part of the, the program, part of the beneficiary that came to China. So they were from mechanical engineering from Amadou Bello University. When they got to this place, they were introduced to traffic and equipment control. These are the people that will, um, that will model the, 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 the machines together, that assemble the, the equipment of uh, the track together. So the transportation engineering are mainly focused on the operation part and the maintenance part. So the civil engineering part are only the design are only emphasized on how to design the track, how to design the alignment, and also all sort of uh, the railway part. 
the railway engineering aspect. So let me understand, you mentioned China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation, and for those not familiar with CCEC, uh, it is, again, a very big player in the infrastructure space in Nigeria. Uh, they're building a lot of the infrastructure there, including the new standard gauge railways. Uh, so you mentioned that they were involved in your program. Did they provide you a scholarship? And if so, what do you have any obligation when you come back to Nigeria to work for them? What's the, what, how does it work there? Yeah, they are the company that initiated the program. But with in collaboration with the Central South University and Amadou Bello University. So this collaboration, this it it was it came as a scholarship, a full scholarship that would be and uh, that would be the sponsorship of the 45 students that came to China. So this CCECC mainly are uh, to just um, cater for our our our, uh, our stay in Ch- in Central South University. So the CCECC um, they made an agreement with Amadou Bello University that. 45 students will be trained in Central South University, and upon the arrival, there will be an, a compulsory one-year internship under them. And um, uh, subsequently, if there are vacancies, they will be employed for the job. So the CCEC really play a major role in the financial aspect of the 45 students that came to China. So, you know, kind of for, for your own career, um, what kind of career path would you like to take? Um, you know, kind of in, in what as- which aspect of, of railway would you like to work? From uh, the start of my career as a civil engineer, there are different branches of um, civil engineering. We have the structural engineering, we have the bridge engineering, the highway engineer. So I uh, was that when the, the, this initiative came up of uh, railway um, engineering, the, my my focus really changed because it's a great investment by my country to have um, initiated such a program. Um, infrastructure is a very great investment a country can build on so as to generate economy for that country. So when I was was given this scholarship and the opportunity, I actually changed my career to us. I want to specialize more on the railway engineering and um, specifically on the railway track structure so as to um, get more knowledge on how to operate and how to maintain and how to design this railway um, track engineer so as to develop and, and de- contribute my own um, knowledge to the development of my country, Nigeria. So you're on your way to a career working either with CCEC or another company to, to maintain and to participate in the railway industry there. Uh, there are 45 of you in this particular class. At the beginning of the show, I talked about the perception that the Chinese aren't doing enough to train local employees to take over some of these these skilled positions. Uh, from what you can see based on your, your, your classmates and what you see elsewhere in Nigeria, uh, talk to us a little bit about that perception that people may have and whether or not it's accurate. Yeah, actually, when you graduate as, uh, as, uh, as a civil engineer, there are opportunities that might open for you. And the main reason why the CCECC were involved is to send, uh, is to, is to get this um, student as an expert into their company because they might have gotten different kind of knowledge in this aspect. And uh, as in Nigeria, there were no railway experts in the country. So their thought was, okay, when the student goes to Central South University, there will be some knowledge they might have gotten and that will assist us being the, the, the only company that is in charge of um, the railway infrastructure in Nigeria. So their thought was, when the student came, they will be employed and uh, they will contribute their own knowledge to the aspect of the development. So, but will there be enough of you to do that? Because you're building a pretty big railway network. Are they training enough young engineers at Central South or somewhere else to, to take over the system in five or ten years? Yeah, um, as at when we're coming, another set of students were followed with us. That is about 60. They started from under level. They start, they'll be um, studying for in this place for about five years. So every year, they're sending about 60 students to China under this platform, under CCECC. So in the next 10 years to come, they might have a lot of labor manf- manpower to put in the system. 
We've been reporting this week um, at the China Africa Project about about issues in in Kenya um, around how how many people are actually using the standard gauge railway in Kenya, um, and some some worries that the the amount that not enough um, freight is being transported on the standard gauge railway to be able to make it profitable. Um, are, are are you worried about certain about similar problems in Nigeria, or is Nigeria following a different a different kind of model that that will help? It make it more successful i think the first um the first the first standard gauge that that just that was just recently launched uh, it was in the, the lagos to ibadan uh, railway line i think uh, for now i don't really have more knowledge of what is happening in the country because they're just starting um in the construction of the standard uh, rail gauge of uh, in, in the country so i don't really have much knowledge in that aspect of maybe there will be any kind of a uh, future problem yeah, as well in my country. The problems that Kobus was alluding to is the fact that uh, truckers have put up a really good fight in uh, in Kenya, and there's a lot of resistance to go to moving freight onto the SGR, bringing particularly into the Naivasha Inland Container Depot, which then hits points inland. And right now, there's a massive debt crisis because they needed to be able to keep those trains full. Last month, they only ran 14 trains from the port of Mombasa into the Navasha Inland Container Depot. And that simply isn't enough to generate the revenue to pay back the loans. So that's a big problem that's also going to confront the Nigerians as they build their their standard gauge railway, that the Chinese aren't doing this as part of a grant. They're doing it as part of a loan, and they want their money back. And the money is going to be based on whether or not people ride these rails, the same ones that Arulag Bay, of course, is going to be maintaining in the future. So with that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about what it was like for you to study in China, because there's 82,000 Africans that are now studying in China. And a lot of people are confused about the experience, and in part because now going back into April, a lot of the news came out of Guangzhou about discrimination and the maltreatment of Nigerians that was all over social media. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your experience this past year of studying in uh, Changsha. Changsha, by the way, is quite a distance away from Guangzhou. Uh, Changsha, uh, Changsha is in Hunan province. Uh, what is the? What was it like for you there? Actually, uh, right from before I left Amadou Ben University, Zaya, I, one of my teachers has always told us because he finished his PhD in the school. So he has always been telling us that Hunan province is the safest city or is the safest province in the whole of China. So it is very safe. There is no kind of uh, racism. There is no kind of um, violence or so ever in the province. So as at this year, 2020 or for the COVID-19, I have not actually experienced any kind of violence, any kind of racism because actually my, my school management has been up to with our safety. They've equipped us in such a way that we are not able to leave their premises um, in order to avoid all this kind of uh, violence, all this kind of troubles that, that has been going on. So the, throughout the, the lockdown in China for about six weeks, my school actually provided for us the, the meal, the two square meal and so. So there was no kind of um, trouble, there was no kind of disruption in the course of my um, of my study. So in China, I could say in my own um, perspective from my own uh, province that China is actually safe. Actually, the Chinese people are always um, avoidance of trouble. They're always avoidance of any kind of issues that might arise. So in, in, in a case of this racism, I could actually say they are trying to see, um, prevent themselves from um, the, the, the spread of the COVID-19. Not actually they wanted to look for trouble or actually want to create any kind of fuse within the, the country. They actually are running after their, their, their safety. So they could always, and they, it's all over the world that the black is always um, neglected, is always avoided because they believe the blacks have some kind of um, uh, kind of disease, have some kind of different thing that they don't like. So anytime the whites see, that the Chinese see the black, they were kind of, no, no, they have to stay away from me, stay away from this, stay away from that. So during the, uh, the, the, the period of of the COVID-19 in China, the, the Chinese are preventing the blacks, the Nigerians or whatever, in as far as you are black, preventing them from using the hotel, using the bus, using kind of uh, any um, national property because all they are trying to avoid is uh, the spread of the disease. So I could say from Onan Pumi said that it's actually safe. We, are not, we, didn't, we didn't actually record a large number of cases for the um, COVID-19 and then the, the, the way the management actually took 
the safety was very exceptional because they tried to prevent everyone from um, such um, virus. So I could say studying in Onan province, Changsha, is very, very safe and very, very fun to be there. You know, I have experience also of moving from an African education system to to an Asian education system, and and the systems can be quite different. Um, so, what were some of the challenges that you faced in integrating into the university system in China? Actually, the the, the methodology that was used in uh, ABU's area was different from the methodology that was used in Central South University, and um, because of the language barrier, there was some kind of textbooks that we were unable to check by ourselves because they were all written in Chinese. So there was no kind of um, any kind of difference actually from the, the system we've been using from um, AB, Amadou Ben University Zaya and the one we met here at Central South University. Uh, the, 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 the lecturer were fluent in English, they were good in explanation, the methodology they used were, were up to standard and then uh, we could because the student that was being selected from Amadou Ben University Zaya were the brilliant ones. So when we got to this place, we were not having such um, difficulty in understanding most of the, the terminologies, some of the basics that is being used on in the, in the program. So we're actually okay with the way things are being done in this school year. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at WitsChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. How do you think your education in China at Central South would be different than, say, if you went to London or the United States? I don't really know. I've not been to London. I've not been to elsewhere rather than Nigeria and China. So I could say I think everybody is using the same standard of uh, education because most of my lecturers actually finish from the U.S. Most of them finish from the Canada universities and so. So I believe they're using the 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 the, the same standard as they were being used in the, in the other countries. And what is what is your plans for for your future career? Like, um, you know, wh- uh, do you plan to do a, a master's, uh, or do do you know kind of to to follow to follow kind of you know going up the the route of of more academic study? Or are you are you kind of heading into work immediately? Actually, the, if you look at the system of the world now, the the, the bachelor degree is not only enough for you to call yourself um, an engineer or a, a professional um, a, a expert, you need to further in a different field so as to get more knowledge on, in the system. Okay, I intended to continue my master here in the Central South University because um, the, the knowledge being got in uh, under the uh, bachelor degree is not enough to call yourself an engineer. So you need to add more knowledge and uh, add more um, basics to what we've got here. So I intended to continue my master here under the railway track structure and uh, specifically because I'm a research oriented person, I want to make research on the operating maintainer aspect as well so as to get more knowledge and at the end when I go back for a job in my country, I could contribute more and more to the development of the railway infrastructure. So, So how is that going to work? Are you going to stay in China now? Because you can't fly back to Nigeria due to COVID. There's no flights. Are you going to just keep going? And do you have to reapply to CCECC to get more funding? Well, tell us a little bit of how that works. Okay. Um, the, the, school is, the school itself have, um, have offered us an opportunity to apply for the, for the, for the scholarship. The CCECC as well, we, who were our sponsorship for the undergraduate, gave their, uh, their, their concept as well that, okay, we could, forward, um, we could move forward with our studies. And after the studies, we can come back to them and uh, offer the, the one-year internship that was being agreed upon. So we have been given the opportunity to study for the master degree. We've been given, uh, some students amongst us have been given admission to study the, the for the master degree. So that we, we are not flying back because the country are here to open the airport. So we, we stayed back and continue by September. 
maybe virtual or physical uh, lectures and so so we are not going back actually to the country for now we'll continue with the master degree are you how do you see you kind of slotting into nigeria's future you know kind of as as a as a railway engineer are you excited about a kind of a future in railway in nigeria that nigeria is going to have a big railway sector coming coming in the future yeah, the, in as far as the, there's continuity in the, in the government administration, I believe that if, there is a very positive uh, future for the country. Right from under the president and the administration of President Olusegun Obasanjo, he has commissioned a 25-year strategic vision to modernize the railway network. So I believe if this is being worked upon uh, continuously, I believe uh, railway infrastructure in Nigeria will bring a lot of um, goodies to the government and to the country as a whole. So I believe there is future for the country in as far as there is continuity in the in administration. Wow, it's so exciting just to hear your optimism. And, and Kobus, you've talked about this in the past, that there is a an optimism that comes out of Nigeria that we don't see coming out of other countries. Not to say that it's not in other countries, but there is something about a Nigerian optimism that is that is very contagious and very exciting, and we certainly hear it today in Adulagbe's kind of plans there. Adulagbe, I know you got to get back to school, so we're going to wrap up our discussion, but I got two very final questions for you. Number one, Hunan province is famous for its food. Did you go out and eat the spiciest food in all of China? Yes, I, as at when I came, as at when I came here, I tested the food. I moved around, uh, chat with the Chinese people, and so so the kind of food that these people consume that it's not on my own part because I don't eat some of the food. So these people, okay, when I came, there was this kind of eating of frog, eating of cockroach, eating of different kind of animals you could not imagine that one could consume. So these people will bring it forth and it's okay, maybe you should taste, have a taste, the pig as well is there. So I look at it and wow, when you compare this with when seeing this animal in real reality, you never imagine that you could consume such. So the Actually, I push it to me that I should try, but I say no, I don't eat such animals, so I have to just put it back. And maybe with subsequently, I might want to try to have some taste and so. But for now, actually, I'm not. But did you try the spicy food? Because Hunan food is super, super blazing hot. Yeah, very. I think much hotter and much spicier than anything you'll find in Nigeria. Of course. Did you try any of that? Yeah, I tried. I tried uh, the chawalamia mifan. I tried uh, the mifan jidan. That so so it's kind of very spicy and very sweet. (laughs) Okay, so other than the food. Uh, tell me one thing that really surprised you about China when you first got there and that just blew your mind, uh, that you didn't expect at all. Because you may have left, you know, leaving Nigeria, coming to China, and you had a, a certain expectation. When you got there, it, it was totally different. What was that? Actually, I was expecting them as at when what we had that if the white people should say the black, they'll actually be running away from you and so. But when I got to this place, these people were even coming close to you to want to take some photograph and so. So they're kind of accommodating, kind of friendly, kind of fun to be with. So these people are not the way they have been described to be. So it was really, really a surprise to see such. Even among the children, the, the kids as well. So they were really, really accommodating very much. Very cool. Arulagbe Shakuruddin Alobanji is a brand new bachelor's graduate from uh, Central South University in railway engineering. He's going to pursue his master's degree. Uh, you are on Twitter and you're getting a lot of love on Twitter. So if people want to follow your adventures in Changsha, where can they find you on Twitter? At El Shaks, at El Shaks 01. They can find me there at El Shaks 01. Wonderful. We'll put a link to Arulagbe's Twitter feed in the show notes. Arulagbe, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, and we wish you the very best in all your studies and your career ahead. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. throughout the discussion with Arulagbe, I couldn't get my mind away from the politics of what's going on today in the United States, and Donald Trump and the U.S. government is now banning or banning or blocking, or I don't know what the word is, but they're not accepting uh, international students to come if they are only going to be studying online. And you just hear about the flexibility that CCECC is doing and China Central University is doing, uh, Central South University, 
and the the optimism and the difference that we're there's a, just a big contrast that I'm seeing there between the the openness that China seems to be exhibiting towards African students and what traditionally has been a, a very strong U.S. advantage internationally is its educational system, and increasingly walls are going up, and it's becoming less accommodating. Uh, you've mentioned this in some of our previous discussions about this, but did that contrast uh, play out for you as well? Oh, very definitely. Um, I think, you know, like always the, the U.S. Um, education system was always difficult to get into, obviously, because of, you know, because it's very competitive and also very expensive. But once you're in, you know, kind of you had uh, this access to this amazing education and then frequently also to, to the labor market after that. And that is just really being closed, you know, not only in the U.S., but also in the U.K. and in Europe. Um, and in contrast, China is is making things easier for African students, which I think is, is, is going to have a massive impact in the future. There's so much of what we talked about today in the discussion with Adelagbe that is just missing in a lot of the news coverage and the broader China-Africa discourse that's going on. So number one, Adulagbe is building up social networks that are going to be critical in his future career. He's building up contacts with professors, he's building up contacts with Chinese classmates, and he's getting an understanding of how the Chinese worldview works so that when he goes back to Nigeria and starts working with Chinese colleagues there or just in a Chinese organization like CCECC, he's going to be more accustomed and more familiar. The power of that cannot be overstated. It is incredibly important, and it's something that I think people don't report and write about enough to understand why China is really going to be, I think, a strong player in Africa for a very, very long time because of these personal networks that are being built on both sides. When he comes back, Chinese engineers in Nigeria are also going to feel more comfortable with him because he'll have a connection with the culture. He'll know how to speak some of the language. He can talk about the different foods. He can connect with them on some of the cultural values. And it can't be overstated. And I think that is missing in a lot of the U.S. and European discourse on China-Africa relations where they skip over that. And those social networks, I think, are critically important. I completely agree. And it's not only a Nigeria and China social network. When I visited a few years ago, I had the chance to visit uh, Peking University and I visited um, a, a group of, of African students and they were from all over the continent, um, like North Africa, like all directions. And obviously, for anyone who you know, kind of who knows Africa, knows that the, that 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 kind of geographical spread also means that there's major language barriers. And so there were these kind of Portuguese-speaking, French-speaking, Arabic-speaking, and so on Africans all together, all speaking Mandarin. Like Mandarin was their lingua franca. Um, and you know, so it isn't just just kind of social networks between Nigeria and um, and China. It's also the social network networks that's being put set up between different African foreign students from different from different areas meaning that you know china has this kind of link to the the future elite of the entire continent i'm glad we had a voice like arulagbe on the show today and his perspective because i think it does serve as a counterweight to a lot of the negativity that we've been seeing coming out of Guangzhou and on social media and a lot of the perceptions that people have about the experience in China that I think for a lot of people who don't have a bigger context from what they've seen over the past two or three months probably walk away thinking, well, it's 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 horrific. It, there's a lot of racism. There's a lot of prejudice. Um, I will tell you, yes, there is prejudice and racism in China, just the same way there is everywhere else. I think the Chinese government has made a terrible mistake by saying we don't have any racism or discrimination. Uh, because it's there. I think what is not being said, though, is that a lot of effort is being made by the university and by, in some cases, city governments and whatnot to insulate them from that. And that's a good thing because being exposed to racism is really not that pleasant anywhere you are in the world. And so it, hearing from Adulagbe the fact that he had this really positive experience to me is very, very authentic. And it mirrors a lot of my own experience. And again, I, I'm different, even though I'm a foreigner in China, I'm not black, but still at the same time, uh, it's really a great opportunity to see what China has. And I'm a, you know, I've loved living in China for all these years. It's a complex, difficult place to live. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, but I think uh, listening to his enthusiasm was very authentic and legitimate for me. Yeah, I completely agree. It was, it was really a bit, kind of a breath of fresh air to speak to him. I think also, you know, kind of circling back to, to the US, I think 
this is again this is a kind of as a kind of um not only social network building but also kind of goodwill creating um system that that i think the the us is going to suffer from you know from having dismantled um in the future i think you know kind of there's i think the us has gained a lot from from foreign students in the past, and, and I think it's a pity that 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 it's made, being made so difficult for them now. Last point that I want to talk about is something that you raised oh two or three months ago. You were talking with somebody, and they had this perception that China was building proprietary standard railways in in Nigeria in particular, and you had to remind them that no, the name standard gauge railway is actually in the name. It's a standard gauge, so they're building an open system there. And again, it just it went to, I think, the misperceptions that a lot of people have about what China's doing there in terms of the construction. I'm narrowing my misperception discussion right now just simply to this question of infrastructure and railway. And, and, and again, it's just listening to what he was saying in terms of the quality of the professors that he felt that they were on international standard. Of course, he didn't have anything to reference or compare it to. But at the end of the day, he didn't have an envy that he wasn't going to uh, Europe or the United States. He felt very satisfied with the quality of the education he got there. And so I guess to the point there, I think that they are doing this transfer in the build, operate, transfer, and they are transferring over the skills. Um, the question that I have is that, is it going to be enough? 45, 60, 70 students a year? Maybe that's just at that school and there's probably other programs that are going on with other schools. I guess that's the question we're going to know in due time. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, the it's it, it's pointing towards a, a, a future in the global education system where this kind of monopoly that we've seen in, in European and, and American universities are, is going to weaken. Um, you know, so... I've I have my PhD is from is from a Japanese university and I've I've faced explicit kind of academic discrimination in in job interviews with um for you know kind of with interviewers kind of implying that the fact that I don't have an American degree is indicative of you know of of something in my own work um and so you know as as an african and as as you know kind of as someone who comes from a non uh, a non western education system um both undergrad in africa and postgrad in in japan um i think it's 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 long overdue you know kind of i think i think it, it's encouraging i think that, that that there's a somewhat more equal playing field developing well we are covering the railway industry every day in minute detail uh in our daily email newsletter if you follow what's going on in africa for your work uh, and you're following Chinese foreign policy for for your profession, I, I really can't recommend enough that you sign up for our newsletter because we are giving a deep dive. And I don't think anybody else is really doing as obsessively as we are. So covering every detail of the standard gauge railway construction in Kenya, also in Nigeria and elsewhere as well. Uh, just go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Uh, if you enter the, the promo code podcast, we're going to give you a big, giant, juicy discount because our most loyal uh, listeners who stay with us all the way to the end of the show deserve a big giant juicy discount so definitely put the po the promo code podcast in there at chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe so that'll do it for this edition of the china in africa podcast kobus and i will be back again next week with another show until then for kobus van Staden, i'm eric olander thank you so much for listening the discussion continues online Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs> <laughs>